possibility to plan if you're only crossing this area from one uh, sector to another. So, what are the lessons learned from the pioneering work? We need to involve our stakeholders early. We need to perform a common safety argumentation because of the cross-border issues. This is something we didn't do in the first uh, implementation, and this is something that we found was very necessary. And uh, we need to perform a gradual expansion of the free route airspace, so it's good to start off locally and then start uh, spreading regionally. The key element is a good concept of operations where we described all the things that needed to be done. Uh, we need to set up a roadmap, have a good meeting schedule, and the uh, most important, of course, is the close cooperation and uh, collaboration. So the end result is uh, quite a complex free route airspace in the middle of Europe where you would have 5,500 flights a day in a peak summer day. 35 airports, there's five different ATM systems, and uh, significant savings uh, per day for the users. So, it can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhailo. I like the title, Sexy FRA. It's nice. Now, I, I, I think some key messages that I took away from is early collaboration. Don't wait. Collaborate very, very early and start small. I think that's the main takeaways, I think. You, don't, you can't do a big bang. And I think if we start there and think of planning everything until we just do it, it's not going to happen. Start small, but involve everyone early. Now, let's continue to move into free route airspace, uh, but uh, through a different kind of alliance. And this, this type, it's an ANSP alliance that's called Borealis. It's not Star Alliance, it's Borealis between ANSP. And let me introduce Rainer Sigurdsson. He is the policy and regulatory director for the Borealis Alliance. It is a business-driven alliance of nine ANSPs in the Northern Europe. His responsibilis responsibilities are to promote and support the interests of the Alliance members with regards to policy and regulations by engaging with European and international organizations and stakeholders. Let me introduce Rainier uh, to present Free Route Airspace Planning for Cross-FIR Implementation. Rainier, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, um, uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> In my presentation, I'm going to um, talk about the cross-FIR implementation of free route airspace, where my emphasis will be on the collaboration and the alliance approach, as we call it, the collaboration of uh, or a business alliance between air navigation service providers. Uh, but let's start with taking a look at the background of it uh, and, and take a look at the airspace in question here. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, as you can see, this, <coughs> this is an airspace uh, over nine uh, states. Um, our collaboration is built on a commercial business partnership. And one of the uh, um, implementation projects we are working on is the free route airspace. Uh, within this airspace, you can see that there are three functional airspace blocks. There is uh, more than 4 million flights per year, more than 11,000 flights a day, and where we estimate to be 39% uh, of European traffic crossing this airspace. Um, uh, it, it's important that uh, there is a um, uh, organization uh, for, for good organization for this kind of a project. And this was initiated in 2015. And with the key principle, who my predecessor here in, 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 in the podium uh, explained very well, uh, regarding uh, a free route plan through entry and exit points uh, with uh, intermediate waypoints uh, without reference to ATS route network, etc. And our vision was to uh, provide uh, uh, preferred trajectories regardless of FAR or area of responsibility. And the, the uh, plus side for being an alliance of this nine navigation service provider, we can pull out experts uh, from all these companies. And uh, to prepare such a big project, it's important to give the uh, project group uh, enough time 
to prepare. And also we have managed, because we are uh, that many ANSPs, to set up expert groups for specific topics. Um, but this is not uh, built on, from scratch. It's not built from a white piece of paper. Uh, there had already been some activities in 2012. Both Ireland and uh, Denmark and Sweden had, in, had implemented free route airspace. Uh, later on uh, this year, uh, we managed to finish uh, what we called North European free route airspace, finalized, where, where Norway, Finland, Estonia and Latvia were added to it. And eventually, in 2021, uh, the entire airspace uh, will be a free route airspace, uh, where uh, Icelandic airspace and UK airspace will be added, added to it. And <clears throat> with so many stakeholders involved uh, and this kind of implementation, it's very important that there is a clear scope and clear milestones. And every member of the alliance has to be very clear on their responsibilities and what they have to deliver and at what time. So we, we put a lot of effort in, in planning that very thoroughly. Uh, but then it's also a part of uh, workload sharing with some, such an alliance uh, can provide um, in, the, in the beginning, in the development phase, uh, collectively we are working on uh, concept of operations, there are system and operational requirements, there are validation plans, so 95% of the work is maybe collectively within the alliance, making the overall scope of the, of the project, where uh, later on when we enter the validation phase, uh, the, the balance changes where the ANSPs come in and are responsible for the local environment we, because we have heard here several times during this conference um, that um, the local uh, implementation is, is best understood by the ANSP who is working there and implementing it. And finally, uh, in the implementation phase on an alliance uh, level, we are mostly just validating uh, the implementation and coordinating where all the uh, detail work uh, is uh, done locally, the manuals, the training, the publication, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and uh, uh, like in the validation phase, we didn't try to harmonize our ATM systems. Every individual ANSP would uh, uh, do the changes necessary for their own systems. Um, what is the secret of successful collaboration? Uh, in our case, we had a wide choice of experts and knowledge. Uh, uh, many of these experts had known each other for a long time. Uh, and trust between the parties had been built up uh, over many years. And uh, these are the people who are involved in this, who understand the need of the location or the, uh, of the, of the local implementation. And we had the um, uh, uh, luxury of uh, splitting the workload uh, between us. And uh, with regard to safety, uh, uh, this is based on current certified processes, um, which uh, each and every ANSP is, um, has uh, got accepted within their state. So the, the, the safety work was uh, basically between the ANSP and the, and the appropriate uh, uh, authority. In each case, we, didn't, uh, we only did the high-level thing, together, but individually each one was responsible for that. Now there are um, ex, um, uh, many benefits uh, on, on cost savings, less emissions, reduced fuel burn and, and so on and so forth, uh, which are uh, quite substantial in, in this case, in such a large uh, um, airspace. But uh, getting to the key challenges, um, um, uh, there was a challenge on, on, on harmonization of work between nine states, nine NSAs, nine ANSPs, but that was uh, a, a very successful uh, collaboration uh, or cooperation, and the nine state NSAs, the regulators, had made their own group, and they are coordinating amongst themselves as well. We did not make a, an, um, an organization above it. The organizations involved in the states uh, did their work and coordinated. To be my main point here, uh, there is a clo close cooperation with the stakeholders, like the network manager. Resources have to be available at the right time. Uh, the civil-military coordination is very important and handled locally. 
and the ATM system uh, technical capabilities are handled locally where each ANSP um, uh, implemented the ATM system changes are tricky, there are very expensive uh, and I wonder if we, we had uh, you know, future concepts which are being uh, discussed at this conference like 40 trajectories, flight objects and so on, whether we could have overcome some of these uh, challenges. Uh, where both, uh, you know, airborne and ground would have, uh, in, uh, were in possession of the same information. And, and that, I, I'm sure, can create uh, uh, some further uh, possibilities cross-border and so on. So, lessons learned here. Uh, uh, it has been said earlier, key to success is early moment of, and cooperation, where all stakeholders involved are involved early. Uh, you have to create a trust and, uh, and, and collaboration between them. And my second uh, lesson learned would be that uh, one size does not fit all. We did the overall concept and the, the aims and, and the goals uh, collectively, uh, uh, but the local implementations were done by the ANSPs in question and all the, the processes that were already in place in the state, certified processes were used uh, in each and every state, and then uh, a coordination is necessary. And as a final remark, uh, um, I, in my opinion, uh, looking from a, a Borealis Alliance perspective, as on a business alliance, we can relate to many things that have been said in this conference. And I can see that future technologies uh, will create many opportunities for further collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rainy. Uh, Takeaway I get from this is that early collaboration you need to create trust. I think it was Nancy who said yesterday that, you know, it's all about human beings and, and creating trust. I mean, you start creating trust, you also share workload. Not everyone has to do everything everywhere. You share it in a way that you get the most out of it. I think your last point there is important to remember that we start seeing these, what I call in the beginning, initial implementations. They've taken it to the step where they can be, but when you start couple them, with other ASBU modules in there, you start getting a picture which is important because these implementations are probably the best R&D. When they start asking for something, they come back and then we all see that we need to couple that with the future data comm, we need to do that with further other ASBU models in the systems and so forth. Now, let me move on and move from, we've been at approach, we've been en route, let's go back to the airport. And I'd like to introduce you uh, Mr. Niklas Gustafsson. Niklas is a trained system engineer and commercial pilot. Since 2016, he is a vice president for business development and governmental affairs in the joint venture between Saab as a manufacturing industry and LFV as a service provider. Just bear that in mind when he presents Remote Tower, the implementation challenges from a manufacturer's perspective. Niklas. Well, good to be here. Fantastic to have a chance to share the views on from an industrial perspective or bridging between the operator and the industry on, on remote tower. Remote tower being anything from a, a tower which is maybe 200 meters away from the runway to 200 or 2,000 kilometers away. And basically what, what it is all about, as you know, it's a way to detach the way you sit from where you do your services. And, and that might be done by cameras or other sensors and then presented in a digital presentation so that can be moved uh, to other places. And, and that's sort of the basic concept of, of making yourself more flexible by using the digital capabilities. Uh, the first thing I, I think I, I like to, to do is just to say that when we worked with this in, in Sweden, where it is in operation for uh, many times, and Jakob will talk about that, but also in other places around the globe, you, it's the same story when you're trying to go and change. There, I shouldn't say it's a paradigm shift, because the air traffic controllers basically do the same service, but you, the management that we operate is slightly different, is that you tend to look at it as a technical thing, but the, the key thing we said and find is that the technical part is just half the solution. You need to look at the operational integration, how that looks in a certain place, to get your, your um, 
your regulator and the understanding, I call it certification or the regulation part as well, in the early beginning, same story as we heard many times before. And also, of course, if you're going to do the change, you need to motivate, motivate that by your business case and understand what, what that means for your company, not only on the global or in a countrywide, but for a specific airport and so on. So as Saab, we try to work a lot to understand this triangle of works before we actually say to a customer, just don't buy that. Try to understand those picture or this picture before we move on. That makes the life and implementation much, much easier when we get to that point uh, later on. Cost-wise, it's sort of tend to be sort of 60-40 or 50-50 with the, the, the technical being 40 and, and the operational and the understanding and the change being on the other side. So this sort of is an extremely important takeaway we had through this in, in the early stage and we're really promoting that. Now this beautiful picture is from London City, as you may be aware, is with, together with a fantastic cooperation with, with Nats trying to introduce that. What I'm trying to say here is that it started, and I had the same feeling 10 years ago, it's, this is for small airports and with limited traffic and so on. But as we move along, we learn all the time that the traffic is not a limitation. The bigger the airport, the more structured is the airspace, can even be time-based. And then the, the, that will not be an impact because the controller actually have the same task as before, but with better tools and with better flexibility and ability to sort of actually implement support and aids and so on on, on the same screen. So this, this discussion about uh, size and, and traffic is not valid, and that has been validated also in, in various research projects. I can think in, if I stand here in two years' time, you will see a number of large complex airports having sort of decided to implement this for contingency or for, for true operation. So that's the speed of, of development. So size is really not an issue in, in this sense in terms of traffic and so forth. Uh, another important takeaway is that when you start to look at this, what you do is that you have not one airport in, uh, in, in operating, you have a center of towers. And in this center of towers, you can start to realize the benefits of combining, it can be a normal traditional ATS, it could be AFIS, you can put in your approach services, you have training, you have MET, you have sort of uh, a way to simulate and so on in a condensed plane, like in a root center, because it, but it's a center of towers instead. And here you start to create the benefit and realize that already what I know is that it's around just combining a few airports give you 10 to 15 percent, and then you add on that, so you will see a benefit of that, and actually even keeping the staff, I think, is easier when you come together. And they can go and train and, and when they have a spare hour, because the, each airport looks exactly the same in front of them. There are no differences in how the radar presentations and so on are, are situated. Another key takeaway is this open door policy. When we started this, we said, do you want to keep it? You know, as an industry, you like to keep it secret and don't tell all your things. We don't maybe tell them how you program it, but anyone who had an interest to come, if it is a controller or a manager or a regulator or a military or a union or someone, come and take a look before you make your judgment if this is doable or not. And I think. I've seen so many people coming in being you know, very reluctant and, and hesitant, but they leave re religiously convinced that you, can actually, you could actually use this and it will improve my daily working environment to a very, very large extent. And that includes you know, this, all these regulatory or standardization bodies also involve them. We, we didn't promote standards first, but work and show that it, that it functions and then start to slowly add these regulatory things with the ASA and now ICAO and, and so forth. And this is, you need to be open and you need to be able to say the good things and there are also challenges in, in this. And I think this has been our key thing. And there's still anyone who likes to, to be invited can be invited. The militaries came and said, <clears throat> is can't you do this in a mobile world? Yeah, you, of course, you're still using digital pictures and you can put them in a center or in a cabin or in a whatever you do. So there's a civil military issue of this as well, which is slowly being developed. Another thing is this, all of a sudden you can detach, as I say, the physical location from the, the service. And when we meet ANS providers or airports around the world, they come and scratch, can we do slightly different? Can I buy a service? I don't need to build a tower, can I just, ask someone to provide everything from infrastructure? Can I do it in, in a different way? Can I pay per hour? Or, and, and all these kind of business model discussions is also something that we as an industry see happening and continuing and, and happening, which is a very interesting piece uh, as, a, as a way to sort of take away from remote tower. And finally, I think the, 
the, everything we talked about here is about changing the way we work, the way we lead and manage our organizations, the way we look at things. So uh, any project, our clear recommendations, make sure you start to do this change management with your people first, to get acquainted and understand what that mean. The social aspects of actually moving people, maybe two kilometers or maybe in sometimes 2,000 kilometers. What's the impact on that? So you, you can sort of reduce the, the impact on that and make it a positive change. And, and I'm mostly convinced that, that in, in, if I stand here in 2021, there will be no new towers built. There will be digital-oriented towers instead of concrete and brick and mortars and so on. Thank you very much. That was my experience from, from the industry side on remote power. Thank you. Thank you, Niklas. Very interesting. Uh, so we say we're going digital whether we want it or not. Uh, I, I think, again, you know, starting small is, is, is a key thing in here. But it's also another thing which pops up in my mind, anyway, when I hear this. So we talk about air traffic services. You've got one sensor that serves many airports, but it's still air traffic services. But I can imagine at an airport, that particular sensor can serve many services at the airport, or the community, for that matter. Very, very interesting. The business model part, I, I think... And coming back again to change management, that we're people in here, we see change management happening, we see business models moving. This example of a manufacturing industry with a service industry joining up together in a joint venture. It's a very interesting piece in that equation. Now, the human being brought into the picture very early, I think it's something that we need to think of. We're all human beings, and even though we've got titles as manager or experts, we are still human beings. Now, let's stay at the airport, and let me introduce to you Mr. Jakob Erdholm. He's a senior ATCO with many years' experience from ACC, TMC, and Tower, including military ACC. Since 2001, his focus has been on operational management at several ATS units, including Stockholm Arlanda, Stockholm Bromma Tower, and ATCC Stockholm, the center. He is from now, May 2017, if I'm correct, the new manager for the remote tower center you just heard of, uh, from Niklas in Stockholm. He will present remote tower, the implementation challenges from an ANSP's perspective. Jacob, floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. First, I want to say I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, this remote tower center in Stockholm is our second remote tower center, so I'll tell you a little, about, little bit about our experiences with building the first one. We have successfully done this. We have currently more than, I think, 6,000 hours of operational experience. So, uh, when implementing the first remote tower center in Sundsvall, in the middle of Sweden, we made some, some um, experiences. First of all, stick to, res to existing rules and regulations. We decided only to make the system inside the existing rules and regulations. It should support the present way of performing air traffic services. Operators are trained to perform the service according to existing methods and need only system training. And of course, bring on the regulator early. We made a stepwise implementation. Small changes in sequence is not only easier to implement, but also easier to grasp and understand for all those affected by the change. We implement one airport at a time, Doing it in sequence gives us an opportunity to use the same team over and over and also evolve our methods of implementation with new findings. The changes are driven by operators' need for a functional system. It helps you to create trust and understanding of the system and also gives us an intuitive HMI. That reduces workload and shorten educational needs. It's also an important enabler, giving positive effects like increased efficiency through multiple mode operations and larger rating groups. We focus on tower service needs. 
We believe there is no need for new fancy features, only technique that improves the ATS service in capacity or safety and supports the intuitive HMI. And we rather see a reduction of workload through methods than technical development. It helps reduce the need for technical education. We have today only three days of technical education for a controller changing from a conventional tower to a remote tower. All of this is part of change management. It's an important factor to make the change work. As mentioned before, a stepwise implementation is one way. We also don't mix a lot of different systems. We let the interaction be handled by one system for all system parts, and the HMI is improved by system integration. In change management, it's also important to bring on the operators early in the process to have true impact on industrial design and create trust. Building the system according to operational needs and early in the beginning, including operations, we think it makes it truly trustworthy. Early in the planning, we decided that our remote tower modules should be as close to a replica of a conventional tower as possible. It gives us the possibility to argue that the service we deliver is the same as in a conventional tower. It also shortens the education of, of course, the approval process. Functions that can't be replicated are replaced with something similar in the remote tower modules, monitors instead of windows. No extra functionality is added, and we truly try to keep it simple. Operational needs must be the driver and base for a technical demand. I'll shortly talk about the regulation, how it has evolved. LFE's assumption was that there was to be no change in the aerodrome ATS if the service would be provided from a location remote from the airport. According to EU legislation, it'd be a functional change and could be handled through the normal change management surface process. LFA analysis of the existing regulatory framework indicated that there is nothing to prevent aerodrome ATS from remotely located facilities as long as the qualified ATC personnel have appropriate means and facilities at their disposal. <coughs> Remote tower system was developed as a part of LFV's engagement in CESAR. In line with the LFV change management system, including safety analysis and human dimension analysis, LFE demonstrated that it's feasible to provide aerodrome ATS in remote locations. Subsequently, Swedish National Supervisory Authority, Transportstyrelsen, based on the evidence documented by LFE, approved the system and operation for operational use. EASA decided to start the process to include remote tower operations in the European regulatory framework. In line with the principles of performance-based regulation, EASA decided to develop a soft regulation in form of a guidance material. It's called Guidelines on Remote Aerodrome Air Traffic Services. First version was published in 2015. It focused on single mode of operations. In line with further development, the initial guidance material has been complemented with advanced features, including multiple operations. The updated version is expected to go out on public consultations very soon. The existing European regulation on training and licensing, licensing was also complemented with a couple of new acceptable means of compliance. The ICAO panel, uh, the ICAO Air Traffic Management Operations Panel, reviewed the ICAO provisions in order to identify shortcomings and develop new provisions as necessary to accommodate remote aerodrome ATS. The panel proposed a visual observation shall be achieved to, through direct out-of-the-window observation or through indirect observation via visual surveillance system. The proposed amendment to PANS ATM is expected to enter into force in November 2018. In line with avoiding duplication of work, the ASA guidance material will be referenced in PANS-ATM, giving it global applicability. 
This is an excellent example of how a good idea can be taken from development to deployment, supporting by an evolving regulatory framework. In my view, it's a true performance-based regulation. There are some challenges remaining in building our remote tower center in Stockholm. Integrating all the ATS units into one new unit uh, is a hard thing to do, and we need to try to work with the different local cultures and local methods. We need to take roostering to the next level. We plan for multiple endorsements, even before we are live with all the units. Another one is to implement remote tower modules during live operations and in the same time keeping the operational needs in focus. We think that um, the way to go is using operational experience in order to push technology forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. When you presented this, and I, I heard this is the way, you've got to keep the operational focus all the time. And I guess for most of us, I think we've experienced a number of technical solutions coming out there looking for the operational problem. I think this one was clearly operational focused. It seems from your presentation, it had the customer out there. There was a big need to do it, and you looked for solutions and started to work them together. I think that's, that's very good. Uh, when you said three days to move from a conventional tower into a remote tower, I think that starts to close in to what we hear about Boeing and Airbus, they move through the families of different aircraft. It doesn't take too long to move from one to the other. I think that's a major step forward that you just presented. Now, uh, I'd like to move from airports now into the wonderful area of system-wide information management. And I'm glad to, to present uh, to you Diana Liang. She is the Enterprise Portfolio Manager in the United States FAA, and she helps to prioritize all next-gen research and development activities within the FAA from a funding and schedule perspective, and to help the national airspace system to recognize and realize many of the concepts and planned performance improvements. Diana, the floor is yours. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Good morning. Um, we in the FAA and all, with our global partners conducted a, a swim and swim demonstration, and we call it Mini Global. Uh, the objective of the demonstration was to promote international harmonization. Uh, there was a lot of question as to what is swim, how do we get about doing that. We also have we also have to take a look at some of the standard that are developed here in ICAO um, on the exchange of information, such as FIXM, AXM, and, uh, and WIXM. Uh, we know that these standards are, are developed at a very global level, but we had to test it and apply that to a, a environment where we have very uh, disparate level of systems. Uh, the maturity of the system may be different. Um, the uh, data model fidelity for, for different ANSPs were, were, are, are different and be able to bring back recommendations to the various ICAO panels on what we need to do to address these needs. And more importantly, it is also important that we f do not forget that a SWIM demonstration or a SWIM is an enabler and that it is important to then leverage that and be able to go back and, and talk to the operational community as to why this is important. So what this is a point-to-point -point information exchange that we have today, ANSP to ANSP to reconnect, and what we may evolve into is point-to-points for SWIM. We have pockets of uh, places where SWIM is in place, is implemented, uh, such as the US and, and um, in Europe. But as more and more areas are going to SWIM, we may run into this situation. So the concept that we looked at is a global enterprise message messaging service, uh, GEMS. We looked to the community, the industry, and said, how, how do you uh, provide us with a, a mean to, to 
allow us to do messaging services without having to go point to point. And we had several of our industry partners who stepped up and say, this is how we would do that. Uh, we, have, um, we have Harris from the Harris Corporation from the US. We have Mosaic ATM from the US. We have a partner uh, in, in Madrid, uh, Indra and the partner, uh, industry partner in Japan, uh, NEC. And the idea here is, this is a notional architecture, is that each of the service providers will service the user um, leveraging on the standards that are developed in, in ICAO and also put in place necessary standards to, to allow them to communicate uh, um, among themselves. So with that architecture, with that concept in mind, this is the instantiation of that architecture that we did under Mini Global. As you can see, there are enterprise messaging services that the community industry together had decided that these are the, the, the necessary component that has to be in place in order to, to provide global service. There are governance, there are validation, security, and routing. And then on top of that, they can then provide value-added uh, services for either the ANSP, for the airlines, for the uh, decision support tools developers. And so what we see here are, are, are the different services being provided uh, to the different partners around the world. Um, one of the things that we have to, to I would like to stress is this is geographically independence. You can see that we have Aerotai uh, or Singapore are connected to the service by Harris that are, that's based in the US. So that is not necessarily tied to what the current ATM or the past ATM system that are geographically con um, constrained. So one of the lessons that we learned is uh, we get really excited talking to among ourselves with the engineers, but if we can't convince or we can't get the message across to the to the operations folks, then then the then we will have a difficult time. Well, there'll be a challenge to move forward. So what we did was uh, we we looked at Swim and and see believe that this is a great enabler for traffic flow management. We took one of the example, one, one, one of the case study of a flight going from Singapore to United Arab Emirates. And the, the, stand, the, the things that we do are, are submit a flight plan. Uh, if there are constraints, we issue an, a NOTAM, and then the flight plan gets submitted uh, and, and change. You, you negotiate the changes, and then we update and fly. So that's the operations. What we see here is the, this is the architecture that we connected up. Um, the, there are three actors here, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, and then um, a mini global viewer. This could be some um, FIRs or, or, part, uh, or uh, stakeholders that are somewhere in between these, these uh, two FIRs. So first, your flight plan is created, and it can, it's because of SWIM and the connection, it then get populated to all relevant stakeholders. Then when there's a NOTAM um, that that's get issues, then it gets populated to, to all the users. Uh, change messages occur, everybody who's who are in the loop are, are going to get that. Um, route negotiation, flight plan update, and departure messages. So all these are important and, and that a, a direct connect would be difficult, would, would be a challenge for us to, to try and get all the relevant information to everybody that are, nece that are necessary um, to, to get that. So, so what is the uh, what is the lessons learned here in terms of operational value? We capitalize on the enhanced automation, access to the information, 
to support the support this decision support tools to improve the performance across the FIRs. Timely access to the data or information will allow us to be more efficient in managing the flight trajectory, but also to balance the, the, uh, the network. Allow for predictability, flexibility. The, the more time you have in terms of making decisions, then the better um, the, the the plan would be. It also opened up a, a whole area in terms of strategic planning tools. Richer information provide the airspace user greater flexibility now to, to ensure that the operation ha ha minimized their impact on their efficiency. The, is it better? Because you, you have better information and earlier, you can maybe be able to absorb the delay at the gate or the stand rather than while you're on in flight. And Global Swim ensure for the continued dissemination of information across everybody that are necessary, which, which is important for us um, in, in this architecture and, and a challenge uh, in terms if we continue with our point-to-point um, -point connections. So because this is Sanus and Michael asked, what is it that, in, that are we, we're getting in terms of implementation or how close are we to implementation? The partners that we, uh, that we worked with, what they learn, what they get from there is when they walked away, they, they learned to develop and deploy their swim infrastructure. Most of them in the laboratory. In my opinion, it doesn't take much to go from the laboratory out to the in implementation. They figured out how to develop interface to connect their own SWIM to the global community. They figured out how to provide and, and saw gaps as to where they could provide applications or tools to support the operations. And, and what happened is in an information-rich environment, now you have access to the data set that is stored on SWIM. That's great. but. Along with that, you have to be, you have to now then start putting focus in the area of governance and security to ensure operations is, is uh, secure. And then we experience seamless end-to-end -end connect connectivities between the airspace user and the air, air navigation service providers. So that was a very important things that uh, we've learned and, and each partner apply those lessons learned to what is important at, at, at the time that we are doing this because remember the uh, systems are diverse and at different level of maturity, different level of complexity. You don't need all the, all the bells and whistle on, on the swim that the U.S. have if that's not, uh, that's not applicable to op your operations. So this is just a... Um, slides on all the partners that we worked with under the demonstration. Thank you. You decided to walk around? Yeah. You didn't want to take the direct track. Thank you, Diana. Uh, very interesting. Th this topic of SWIM, uh, I, I think we've heard a lot of it, and I think there are interesting experiences about SWIM and what what goes through here, but one, one thing I take away from this is that it seems that the core set of information in the whole aviation and ATM system is what we sometimes talk about as the flight plan. Uh, that data rich piece that is somewhere out there in the system but is not quite shared all across, but if we start sharing it across, we can connect all digital information and data to it and you get a place where you got all the information continuously shared through the swim environment all the way through. I think it's something that we need to start thinking of. Do we need the right, how do we have the right tool, do we have the right provisions and how do we move forward on this one? But I think your collaboration piece here of everyone working in this will enlighten us all as to the level of provision we would like to have both from industry standards as well as from ICAO provisions in the way forward. Now let me move from swim now to what I sometimes call it the network management. How do you connect the whole network? How do you see your assets? How they are configured and how do you make it work with a proper balance of demand and with capacity? I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Joe Sultana. Uh, Joe is the director of the network manager in Europe. 
And I can tell you, Joe's a good friend of mine, I've known him for years, and what he doesn't know about air transport, aviation and ATM, and ATF in particular, is not worth knowing. Joe, you don't have to walk around, you can come direct. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's for me a pleasure and an honor to, to be here and present. What I want to talk about is the regional, a regional implementation. We're talking about a regional network of 43 states, EU states or states which have an agreement with the European Union, member states of Eurocontrol. And we want to talk about the implementation, I would like to talk about the implementation of a concept that focuses on the performance of the airspace of the states while maintaining the safety levels. And hopefully it is also, it will help other regions and sub-regions in their development. <clears throat> the role, we have, playing the, we have been playing this role as the network manager for more than six years now. We were appointed as the single European Sky network manager in July 2011. And I think the four key phrases are what's in bold. We want to optimize the, net, the operations. We have performance targets that we want to meet for the network. We do this in a coordinated, and con a coordinated approach. And we want to add value to all the aspects that make up the performance of a system, whether it's capacity, the day reduction, environment, flight efficiency, safety, cost efficiency. At the network level, network management is being done at a European network level. And the one thing I want to clarify is that the network manager in Europe is not a different name for its old version, the Central Flow Management Unit or the CFMU. We are looking as network manager to improve the European performance through the different enablers addressed together. We want to increase and make the best use of the capacity before we start doing flow management. So the network manager encompasses both the creation of capacity, the best use of that capacity, but then when we can't do anything, about, anything else about it, or something happens on the day, then we apply air traffic flow management. These are some of the areas that we address. So it's different tasks, different expertise needed, different domains, but there's still one objective. What can we do to improve Europe's ATM performance by actions taken at network level? We do not do it alone. We have the links with the airports, with the towers, with the ACCs, their flow management positions, with the airspace users, civil and military. We also link to our immediate neighbors through the circles that we, you can see there. And we expand gradually to what eventually we hope will got, become a global ATFM community. So basically, we don't see this as just a European concept. We are part of a global concept, and gradually we would like this to expand so that this unique collaboration between all the stakeholders uh, providing ATM will benefit not just regional operations, but global operations. It's a 24-7 operations, which sees, knows, and understands what is happening in European airspace. We know the demand, we have a good understanding of the airspace organization, we know the available capacity, and we use our dedicated links to all ACCs, to the airspace users, to provide a service, an impartial service to the, the customers to, of the network. It 
it is not done, as I said, it may be a 24-7 operation, but we think strategically. We prepare, we plan, we operate systems, and we play our part by our network-wide services. And then, once the operation is done, we have monitored it, we analyze, and start again and improve. So for us, this life cycle of improvements is, as you see, not just focused on the operation, but there's a lot of work done before to make sure that that operation is the best we can get on the day. So this European concept, we have the means to perform the tasks, both during normal operations and also during disruptive events. And they can be major disruptions, they can be even crises. So part, an essential role of a network manager in a region is actually to be there for major disruptions, for crises. I think, again, try to emphasize that we are doing this, it's, this is not just about flow management. This is about having the wider picture. Having a network approach will benefit the airports, the TMAs, the end routes, the reserved airspace, the demand. Having this holistic approach, having this vision, having this view, we can better identify the needs and the accuracy, the accuracy of capacity plans. And then coordinate the implementation of concepts and regional projects and allows us to have dynamic management of the airspace and its component parts. And we are a focal entity for that. It's not too complex in the sense of what we need. We need airspace and nautical data. We need to keep it updated. But then we also need the flight plans. We need flow management. And we need to then monitor the data, the airspace, the, 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 the flights. So those are the components of what you need on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. We have taken the concept, the IKEA concept of flow management, and we have added two bits. The top part, where we look at the planning part, so looking at performance targets, looking at the demand at a strategic level. And we've added the post-ops analysis and performing. This is ICAO's ATFM concept. And we add the bit on the before and the bit afterwards to make sure that we have a, a whole process that helps us to regenerate and make sure that we meet the target. And just one slide on Europe. I think the red is showing the traffic, and you will see that the highest demand ever in Europe in 2017. The blue bars are the delay in minutes. It's under control, although it's not meeting the targets that we have. But we have to be ready for this line to go further up. So we have to look ahead into what's are the issues that keep us working and planning for the future. The challenges are known. I've just mentioned the traffic, costs, emissions, and the need for safety. We have constraints. We have the laws and regulations, the fragmentation, the traffic growth, and like everywhere else, we have unions, we have controllers, we have pilots, and who have to move with us in this. So there are the challenges, there are the constraints, but fortunately we have R&D, we have deployment through the CESAR activities, and we need to be prepared to be able to implement this deployment through an, a modern architecture and interoperability uh, tools and, 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 and processes. So, for us, we are looking at the future and evolving our own systems in terms of what do we need to move into this digital 
transformation. That is the key to all the R&D that is being addressed. We have concepts, we have operational concepts coming off Cesar, and we need to make sure at the network level that we are investing and being able to deliver the concepts through the new digital means. It may look simple, but basically we need to make sure at a regional level, at a European level, that our systems, the data, and the information can be shared. And it can be shared in a way that is acceptable to everyone, that is built in advance collaboratively, it's cost effective, and make sure that it allows us to be able to plan across a network on the same data and assumptions. We've talked about SWIM just now, and I think from the network manager point of view, in Europe, you know, with our evolutions, we are addressing and supporting the digital transformation of ATM. We have our current links today. We are looking to supplement those links with business-to-business -business swim, uh, swim links to the AOs, to the ANSPs, to the airports. And we do it also at a wider level. We have links with the different continents, with the different providers and ANSPs in different parts. And so we are happy to be able to be part of this process, as I said, of enabling digital transformation of ATM. This is done through a collaborative process, supported by a regulatory process coming out of the single European sky. It is not an easy process. Europe seems to be uh, a region, but there are quite a number of states. And so what we do is have a governance of this network manager, which allows us to involve everyone, whether it's the NSPs, the airspace users, the European Commission, Euro control, and the military. And what we do together is have a cooperative decision-making process, where basically we take decisions in a constant interaction between the stakeholders and the states. I think it's important to get progress and movement across a region. So what I would like to do is finish with a summary, which basically say, addresses the, the importance of having a regional approach. We have to deal with a complex environment. We have to understand the traffic growth. And we have to make sure, in our view in Europe, that we need a regional approach to meet these performance requirements. Through our traffic flow management processes and systems, we have a basis to go wider. And this is the starting point for the network manager concept. We think we have a good balance between network initiatives, the collaborative processes that are needed with our NSPs and the airspace users, the systems which talk to each other, and are able to deliver the performance of the European system that is needed. And for that, we need the need of a network manager who is impartial is one of the foundations of the European single European sky. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Interesting to hear you hear the network manager in Europe. Of course, this is a typical European way of doing things. We've got done it this way. It's a true collaborative process. You heard that. And you know Europe's not that simple to deal with. There are a number of states and a number of stakeholders and a number of organizations behind. So you're doing a fantastic job. I think your evolutionary part here was interesting. Uh, even though it's European specific, by going digital and going for automation, uh, you talked about integration in the future, and I think that will be uh, an interesting thing. Where do we integrate? Or which, where do we integrate business-wise? Up the value chain? Down the value chain? I think that's something for us to think of for the future. Now, let me move to a controller-specific uh, view of the future. And let me introduce Jean-Francois Lepage. 
He is the industry observer representing IFATCA, the International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers Associations, on the Air Navigation Commission. He also works at NAV Canada as a team supervisor in Montreal ACC. So he is used to the cold weather here. I'm not. Jean Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Not afternoon yet. I know we're all looking for the coffee break uh, coming up, but before that, I would like to take you somewhere else. Skydiving. Who in this room has done skydiving? A few courageous people did it. What is the link with implementation? Well, implementation is a little bit like skydiving, actually. It can be very exciting. It can, it can also be a little bit frightening. For most people, the question that comes to your mind before you jump is, am I ready for this? Am I well enough prepared for this? Controllers and other stakeholders always wish that they're well enough prepared for their implementations. But at some point, you have to jump. What I ask my fellow controllers in IFATCA is how do you decide when you're ready to jump? What is it that you're looking for to have a successful implementation? And those are some of the answers they gave me. Our controllers need to be properly trained. We have to be involved in the development process and, I'm sorry, all phases of the implementation development. We have to make sure that safety is maintained and enhanced. I said, okay. I turned to colleagues, supervisors and managers asked them the exact same question. And these are some of the answers they said. Oh, we need to train the controllers properly so that they're confident with the systems and equipment. Oh, we need to make sure that we have a proper risk uh, analysis to make sure that safety is guaranteed. We have to involve all stakeholders, including controllers, from the beginning. So, it seems that most of the time, controllers, supervisors, and managers we all share the same opinion with regards to what is needed to jump, what is needed to achieve a successful rollout. I could have asked CATSEPs, pilots, procedure designers, airspace designers. Chances are we would all answer the same thing. And Ms. Kusa, a director from CA South Africa, said it very well on Wednesday. Why is it that after 12,000 SARPs, we still face sometimes implementation issues? What can we do better? And what do we have to keep in mind to make sure that our rollouts of new procedures, of new system, abide by these principles? Well, there's one thing I'm sure everybody in this room will agree, is that we need a carefully designed plan. The plan is essential. The thing is, sometimes we tend to underestimate the importance to involve all stakeholders at all stages of our development. Getting everyone on board is paramount to success, if we want to avoid shortcomings during our implementation. Looking at new concepts like TBO, SWIM, FFIs, we've heard a lot about it this week, uh, they bring complexity to an already complex system. What it means is that more actors will have to be involved in development and rollout of those systems. Development and implementation teams can no longer work in isolation. They can no longer work in silos. Hmm. I'm sorry for the slight thing. Uh, so these new systems, ideas, and procedures will change the way controllers will have to work in the future. Without adapts, controllers and other stakeholders will have to adapt, and they will have to be flexible. Otherwise, we end up with problems that, like those we can see on the slide here. A poorly planned and a poorly coordinated implementation costs money. It costs time. It creates frustrations. The controllers are not happy, and we don't want that. The managers are not happy. We don't want that either. The customers are not happy. No one is happy. So why does it keep happening from time to time? And let's face it, we've seen in the GAMP and the GASP that the amount of new concepts and systems introduced in the ATM world will not decrease in the future. It will only increase. So we'll need to have that intensive cooperation on an ongoing basis. That collaboration can take different shapes and forms. There are several ways for controllers to be involved in a successful rollout. Controllers can, and they should, take part and be involved in the design, 
in the development, in simulation, in tabletop exercises. They can help establish the user requirements. They can take part in the training development. How many days in the simulator do we need? And when do we start? How many weeks in advance do we need to have uh, shadow over the operations? They can take part in the hazard identification and risk assessment process, procedures development, validation of the system, and of course, they can provide feedback on how to improve in the future. But it's not only about controllers. Uh, there's other actors that should be involved in implementation and development teams that include system developers, we're talking about software and hardware engineers, project managers, uh, other end users when applicable, supervisors, ADCEPs, legal experts, human factor and safety specialists, etc. Few items to keep in mind. Proper backups are required and contingency procedures in case we need to go into degraded mode. Of course, with that, controllers will have to be trained on these degraded modes before the implementation and periodically after implementation. If we're talking about equipment and software, it will have to be maintained. We need properly trained and qualified personnel. Also, we need a proper fault reporting procedure so that when something is identified, it is reported and corrected as soon as possible. What we have to keep in mind is that the change should not be a burden. It should be a help. What do I mean by that is that if we have so many workarounds to put in place to make the system work, we lose all the benefits of it. Human factor is also something to be, and I see Dr. Miller right there, she will love it. It has to be considered. What I mean by that is that a user-friendly system has better chances to be adopted and to work efficiently right from the beginning. Efficiently and safely, of course. A few examples. This one is from my personal experience. We implemented in Montreal ACC ADSC about a year ago. And the way it was done, in my opinion, was great. We were invited to visit another ACC where they were using it to get familiar with the system. When we came back home, we were invited to take part in uh, the tailoring of the different parameters of ADSC. We installed it on a few consoles, looked at the behavior, made additional changes, and the, the controllers were sufficiently trained so that they were comfortable when we rolled out. During that implementation, we had subject matter expert coverage, we had extra staffing, contingency procedures were in place in case something went wrong, and the developers were in place, uh, were, were in the ops floor to see uh, if they needed to do some changes. The result, very few corrections were made, Controllers were very happy, we liked that, and it was a big success. And another example from, uh, from a friend uh, in Europe, they decided to get rid of the paper strip and go electronic. The system was developed in 18 months by a team of controllers and developers. The developers were even present in the simulator while they were testing the system. So whenever something was not working, developers were there to help, and the problems were fixed, uh, well solved quickly. Overall, it was a big success. A last one, migration to a new building, a new ECC, including a new RDPS system. It was planned for 2004, then delayed to 2008 and 2011. In this case, the controllers were not involved in the beginning, and when it was time to test the system, the management and the controllers realized that they had so many workarounds to put in place that it was not possible to go forward. They went back to the development side, made a, t a task force of controllers and developers and other stakeholders work on the issues, and in the end, they've been able to implement. The project was a big success in the end. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one message that you should remember from this presentation is that controllers are at the forefront of implementation. And this is why they should be involved in the analysis, the design, the development, the rollout and the feedback phases of any implementation project. So next time you have an implementation or next time you go skydiving, I wish you all to jump and be confident that things will go well. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. So, Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, all the panelists, uh, cautious of time, and I'm a true believer in on-time performance management. I seem to be a little bit 
beyond that time for the moment. So let's let's end there. But I think uh, let's give a big hand to to the panelists and all their implementation experience across the different flight phases. I'd like to give you a big hand as well, participating in the discussions, but you get a chance to do that, because we'll end this before we go for lunch later on uh, with a panel session where the next panel on AIM will also come on stage and we discuss then. But uh, I would like to thank now Air Transport Canada for sponsoring the coffee break, and I'd like you all to know that we have to be back here at 11 o'clock sharp, where we start the AIM session, and then after that, as I said, the panel with all the previous speakers. Thank you very much.